Uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had uh, some of uh, the lovely muffins out there and tea and coffee. Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Derek Law. I'm delighted that Derek is able to join us here today. Uh, Derek is the chair of Disc Advance, which the RSC is part of, uh, as you know. Um, Derek, uh, I'm sure a lot of you already know Derek, has worked in several British universities and has pub published and spoken at conferences extensively. Um, he's a regular project evaluator for the EU, and most of his work has been to do with the development of network resources in higher education and with the creation of national information policy. Recently, he's worked on the use of wireless technology in developing new methods of teaching and learning, and this has been combined with an active professional life in organisations related to librarianship and computing. So I'd like to... Welcome, Derek, uh, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good morning, Just. Um, I thought I'd start with this blank slide, because I've got two or three things to say before I get on to the context of my talk, uh, and you could probably guess what the subject is from the official title in the programme. But first of all, um, can I publicly apologise to the organisers for not having turned up until now? Uh, one of the sad things about retirement, which I'm allegedly doing, is that you finish up doing far too much, and I've had to travel up from England this morning and couldn't get up in time. Uh, the second thing is to say, uh, because we're streaming this, I have to say hi to Cathy in Canada. That's Teresa's sister, who's evidently got up at some ridiculous hour of the day in the hope of seeing her. Um, and the third thing is just to say a little about what I'm going to talk about um, and it's as easy as ABC. Anniversaries is the theme of the talk. This is a year of anniversaries, as you all know. And the gag about the icebergs, it's pretty obvious which anniversary I'm going to celebrate. Uh, the second thing is, is brands and images. I'm, I'm very doing a bit of work in the moment about images and the power of images. And so in terms of anniversaries, uh, you only have to go like that and pretend you're at the front of a ship and everybody knows which anniversary. You're, yeah, you know which anniversary you're talking about, so we'll get on to that. Um, and the third thing is concealment, because the, the first image that I want to show, uh, if this works, what am I going to point it at? I need some help here. It's not working on next, and it's not showing up on the laptop. That blows the great introduction, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, oh, it's gone back to the second one. This is the first one I want. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, you've no idea how much time I spent on Photoshop doing that. <laughs> anyway, here be dragons, or was it icebergs? Uh, really, my job today is to say a little about the future of JISC and where JISC is going. Uh, yes. So the new JISC, JISC, as you'll know, is, has been undergoing a major review and is going under major restructuring. And the question I want to address is whether it's a great advance or whether it's an accident waiting to happen. Um, and I just wanted to draw some parallels with that great ship of the White Star Line whose name we don't even have to mention because you know exactly which one I'm talking about. Except it's not the Titanic. It's another ship of the White Star Line which was also the largest ship in the world after the Titanic went down, which also had an accident on its maiden voyage when it had a nasty accident crashing into something at sea. It's not the Titanic, it's the RMS Olympic, her sister ship, which was built on the same lines, was built for the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic travel, uh, and which finished up mainly being used as a troop ship during the First World War, where it earned the nickname Old Reliable, which is what I think JISC is going to be. JISC is the Old Reliable of information services and will continue to be so. So there's going to be a lot of change, but that change is in one sense superficial, because what's changing is the crew on the bridge, not the team in the engine room. There's going to be a lot of restructuring. Now, some of that's formal. Uh, perhaps surprisingly, JISC is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a Joint Information Systems Committee. It's a committee uh, and not an organization, which is why JISC has had to create companies like JISC Advance, like uh, JISC Content, and like Janet itself, because the only way you can hire staff is through the companies. JISC has no staff formally. All of the staff that JISC employs are either paid for by the Higher Education Funding Council in England or else are employed by the companies or else are employed by the host institutions where they sit. 
So there's a lot of formalism going on in the GISC change, which is simply about making sure that it turns into a modern company rather than being a committee. But most of the activities will continue to be done, although there is a zero-based review going on just to show how efficient things are. Now, the result of a zero-based review, for example, in the case of GISC Advance this year, is that the capital budget has been cut from 20 million to 12 million. Sounds dreadful, doesn't it? But then we've had a non-recurrent addition to the budget of 8 million. As far as the politicians are concerned, our funds have been slashed. In reality, things carry on very much the same. So the other thing I like about this, although know, you can't quite get it, you can't quite get it on the screen, is one of my favourite poems, which is not nearly well enough known, Kipling's poem about engineers, his pee into engineers, called MacAndrew's Hymn, uh, which is all about reliability. It's all about power. I seem to see the hand of God in the strider yon connecting rod. And that's what just continues to be about, delivering the services that we've always delivered. There will be a review. Some will go, but the ultimate, the ultimate things that we deliver will all be there. If you can't read it properly there, go and read MacAndrew's hymn. It's a great poem. And as I say, not nearly well enough known. Now, why am I saying the engine room will continue? Well, if you look at the stuff that the engine room team delivers, this is not something that's going to go away. Savings. The whole point about JISC is that it's shared services, whether that's a shared network, whether it's tech disk, whether it's JISC legal, whatever we do, we share. Now, you know, how much do we save? But we have commissioned studies from economists, so they must be true, which demonstrate that the shared services which JISC Advance alone can demonstrate come at 122 million a year. In other words, if JISC Advance didn't exist, your individual colleges and universities would have to pay that much extra. So there are very real, very tangible savings from working together. It's kind of blindingly obvious. We only need to put numbers to it to persuade politicians, but it's rather obvious, I think, that doing things together saves money and is more economic. Then look at how much activity goes on. 12,000 help desk calls a year and 12,000 people attending our training events. I just wish these two numbers weren't so similar. You kind of feel they must be related in some way. People phoning up to say, how do I get to the event? But I'm sure it's not that at all. So 12,000 calls a year. So that's a lot of help and advice and support. Of course, if we were doing it properly, there would be 12,000 this year and none next year, but we'll gloss over that a little bit. 12,000 of those, that's a lot. 600 events. This is one of the 600 events that are involved every year. Through the RSCs, uh, through Janet, through uh, conferences, training sessions, regionally, locally, all over the country. The impact calculator, the, I've just picked two examples of things we do. The impact calculator has been a huge success. And again, it demonstrates that although the role of JISC and JISC Advance is specifically for higher education and further education and the skills sector generally in the United Kingdom, it's much appreciated abroad. The impact calculator simply tells you what will be the impact of any, any development that you're planning? You can work out what the cost savings will be. The examples that we use relate to the better management of information within organizations, and that's one of the areas where we can make and demonstrate real savings and real impact. But having a reach out to 64 different countries, including Cathy in Canada, is, uh, is pretty impressive, I think. And finally, guidance on managing research information, and I do want to draw attention to that one in particular, one of my hobby horses. Uh, the impact of guidance on managing research information, which to me is critical to the future of institutions. At the moment, it tends to be left to academics, and they make a pig's ear of it. And the reason I say they make a pig's ear of it is because of this climate gate. Now, you may think that's faded away very slightly, but it's an, an, it's an object lesson in why you should never trust academics to do anything beyond what they're paid to do, i.e. research and teaching. Uh, in short, the, <clears throat> the story of this, most of you will remember, was that at the University of East Anglia, uh, the e climate change, of course, being a very big and very sensitive topic, and the, the doubters and the believers, uh, at East Anglia, they had a big contract from the United Nation to, Nations to manage the data and provide a neutral and objective scientific view. Their emails were hacked, poor IT security. Their emails were hacked. Um, then some of the data was hacked. There were freedom of information requests which were illegally turned down. And in the end, after all of this, there had to be a public committee of inquiry, which uh, Muir Russell led. And uh, 
the professor who was in charge of all of this had to resign. His reputation's in ruins. He has no career left. The department will never get a research grant again because nobody now trusts them because they were accused of manipulating data and were unable to deny it effectively to show that they hadn't manipulated the data. And the reputation of the University of East Anglia is now shot. So there's all sorts of knock-on effects on other departments who are suffering because of one bad apple. When they had the committee of inquiry, it turned out that what had gone wrong was basically a failure to manage information. There was no audit trail for any of information. The professor in charge of this data didn't know where he got it from. He didn't know who had amended it or when. He didn't know how it had been changed. He appeared in his emails, but wasn't actually, but he appeared in his emails because of loose wording to be saying uh, that he had massaged the data. Uh, in fact, he was editing it for publication. Uh, he had massaged the data. And in general, they just hadn't had a clue to manage how to manage information. There were no audit trails. There were no clear lines of responsibility. In other words, the basic sort of management of information that anybody in this room would be capable of doing was assumed, but not there in practice. Now, we don't let academics look after health and safety. They follow the rules of the institution. We don't let them do minor building projects. They follow the rules of the institution. I can see no good given reason why they should be attempting to manage information when it is quite clearly beyond their competence. They have no training, no skills. So at the risk of being a little obsessive, it does seem to me that that whole area of information management is absolutely critical to the reputation of institutions in ways they don't even begin to understand until it goes wrong as it went wrong at East Anglia. And one message I want to take back is the, is the way in which JISC Advance is involved in managing data. Now, it's not just research data. Research data is perhaps the most obvious and the most important. But it applies to all sorts of human resources data. The University of Belfast is having problems with that. It applies to studies which students do. The University of Stirling has been having some trouble with that. All sorts of data which the institution manages really needs to be properly managed with proper rules and procedures. It's quite good that, isn't it? <laughs> I'll try and stop doing it. <laughs> and we have the techniques and we have the technology in JISC Advance to be able to support and help you to do that. <coughs> so the new JISC, excuse me, the new JISC will be divided into three broad areas. Uh, first of all, there will be the infrastructure services. That's broadly what was Janet in the past with various additional bits on top like cloud computing and cloud services and so on. Then there will be the data and content services, which will be the content management uh, uh, division, plus various things like Adena and, and the other current content providers built into one organization. And then finally, there will be services and support, which will include JISC Advance. Now, we, we rather coolly like to think this is a reverse takeover by JISC Advance. We're taking over all the other bits that should have been there in the first place but weren't. But it will be a fairly new structure, but it will be built by adding things and accreting things which provide services. This is the one which is, is perhaps most fluid at the moment. It's the area which will possibly change the most. But the changes are going to be on the bridge, not in the engine room. Very largely, anyway. There will be a significant focus on customer relation management, which JISC Advance already does, but the rest of JISC, we're having to teach them what CRM actually is. Um, and I wanted just to give uh, a reassurance, in a sense, that the fact that this restructuring going, is going on doesn't mean that there's an end to innovation. It doesn't mean that we have to stop everything and freeze everything until the decisions are made about the future. And I just wanted to highlight five of the things uh, I think it's five, that the JISC, JISC Advance board are working on at the moment and which we're rolling out or developing or expanding, not so much to try and sell them to you, they sell themselves, we hope, but just to demonstrate that that engagement, that that activity, that willingness and ambition to meet the wants and needs of the community still lies there. It's going to take about two years to reorganize JISC into this new structure. You'd be amazed, well, you probably wouldn't be amazed at how much work is involved in changing conditions of service and changing contracts, changing pension rights, moving people from one city to another, all that sort of thing. Uh, but in the meantime, we will keep driving ahead. We're not going to stop and freeze things. So the ones I want to talk about are the new Shibboleth website, which is all to do with access management, uh, the relaunch of the exchange service. I 
didn't even really know that this existed until we started talking about it. Uh, the release of the brand new Nexus One, which manages data, uh, shared legal, and you can learn a lot more about that outside uh, later on, and a new, a new JISC mail, uh, modernizing the, the JISC mail that we know and love, which is, still appears to be set in the 1970s, if not the 1960s. So first of all, Shibboleth. Shibboleth has been slowly and steadily expanding over a number of years. It's about access management. The big fun has been getting publishers engaged. But it's now well beyond critical mass. Uh, we're doing an awful lot of work with Shibboleth to, to renew it, revivify it, to get more publishers in, uh, to get more content providers in, and of course to get more institutions in. And it's always a big hit with users. That's the main thing, because it makes their life easier, not having to remember dozens of passwords in dozens of different locations. Then Exchange, which literally does what it says. It allows you to change your second-hand kit or the kit that you've bought in error uh, with other institutions uh, and to actually reuse effectively. It's good financially. It's good morally. It's good ecologically. It's a win-win kind of thing to do. Um, most institutions are littered with old bits and pieces that somebody somewhere could find a use for, and this is the mechanism to do it. Nexus has just been launched. Um, it's it's uh, fairly high level at the moment, but it's beginning to expand. And what Nexus does is make sure that data is only used once. Again, this is one of these very obvious things that everybody talks about and attempts to do. But we have to get the same data and send it to statistical agencies. We have to get the same information and send it to research agencies. We have to get the same data and send it to the HR department. We have to get the same data and send it in a different way to the dean. And data is processed loads and loads of times in most institutions needlessly because we don't manage the process effectively. And Nexus is all about providing the centralized tools, the, the boxes, the switches, which means that data once it's in the system, can be reformatted, reused, and reapplied, and sent to official agencies, and it has the seal of approval, which means nobody questions, well, they may question the data, but they won't question the source of the data. So it makes sure that data is approved, official, recognized. Um, there's a lot of potential for that, because you, organizations, um, all of our organizations, subsist on statistics and data. Government insists on statistics and data, and an awful lot of uh, manpower, person power is used in just manipulating the same data into different formats to send it to different agencies. And this will make life a lot easier. If you don't know about Nexus, explore it. Your management will love you for making life easier. And JISC Mail, we're just in the process of retendering for JISC Mail. Now, JISC Mail is huge. It, it, it gets to zillions of people in loads of countries. It, it has something like a million registered users. There are something like, I forget, the number's up there, over 3,000 lists. And it must be the most old-fashioned technology. I don't know, everybody in the room, I guess, is on several JISC mail lists. They must be the most old-fashioned emails that you receive any week, I guess. Well, we're now actually going to modernize that. <laughs> We've discovered this new thing called the web, which we're going to use for JISC mail. And that's not really a new service, but actually trying to make it a bit more fit for purpose. It's clearly a service which is much valued and much used, but we'd actually just like it to look as though it was fit for purpose. Um, it is fit for purpose, but it doesn't look like it. I can see nodding heads here. You know what I mean. Uh, so we hope uh, that contract should be awarded within the next two months and will be rolled out within the next 12 months. And just shared legal. I, I feel slightly um, nervous mentioning this when there are just legal people about because they know <laughs> so much more about it than I do. Um, in a formal sense, uh, JISC, of course, deals with technology. And it was stretching things a little bit to even set up JISC legal in the first place. Uh, the argument was that it was the, the, the legal bits related to IT, so we could do it. But now we've got the OK to move into all sorts of other legal stuff, uh, human resources, contracts, all that kind of stuff. Again, on the basis that a shared service, particularly for smaller institutions, is much cheaper. And uh, anybody here from smaller institutions, it's quite instructive if you can go back and try to find out how much your institution spends on legal advice in a year. The numbers are phenomenal. Quite understandable. People want to make sure they've got a sound basis for making decisions. But if we can cut these bills by even 15%, we will be saving institutions huge amounts of money. 
So Just Legal has taken on the task of setting up this new service. It's a subscription-based service. That's the way the world is moving. But I think it's going to be very easy to demonstrate that that subscription will show a huge return very quickly in year one. Am I saying the right things, Jason? I don't know where he is up there. Yeah, saying the right things? If you want to know what's really happening with all of this, talk to Jason or talk to the people at the desk. Uh, but we're really very pleased that we're moving ahead on this field. It's allowing us to move into new areas of activity and ones which are clearly of value and interest to the sector. So it's, uh, there's a big, uh, a big sporting event coming up, uh, the Commonwealth Games. Uh, so I thought I should finish talking about what's going to be happening over the next year or two, as opposed to any rubbish that's happening anywhere else. Um, and just talk about the things that we have been working on within JISC, within the JISC board, these are fairly standard kind of management speak things, but for, I, I've put this up because for me they captured quite a lot of what we're trying to do over the next 12 to 18 months in the run-up to the Commonwealth Games, which will be held in Glasgow in 2014. Um, we need to develop a rationale. That's kind of self-evident. But JISC has never really had a rationale in the past. It's been like Topsy. It's just growed. Um, it's done all sorts of wonderful things. It has responded to the needs of the sector, but it's, it's listened to the sector, but it's never actually had a coherent development policy, a coherent development structure. So there will now, we're going to work much harder on developing the rationale for why we do things rather than allowing, say, third-party commercial people to do them. Uh, we want to make sure that we're working with key stake stakeholders. Again, that may seem obvious, but it's something that's happened rather randomly. Uh, there's a huge dominance of the, the network nerds in the Janet board at the moment. So the research councils, for example, have a hugely disproportionate, in my view, have a hugely disproportionate influence on the future and development of JISC because they need very powerful and very expensive research computing. But if you look at the numbers of people in the sector, the sectors that we're trying to reach to, we haven't really got that balance right. So we need to work much more with making sure that the stakeholders are fully engaged and we're doing that. Customer relationship management, that's partly what today is about, but much more specifically, we, we're talking about having identified team members working with institutions to identify their needs. So rather than us coming, in, than us coming and selling you products, we'll be coming to talk about what you need and then trying to develop the tools to help with that. Uh, the same communicating extensively in person, we're going to do much more of that working with individual institutions knowing the people that we work with. Again, it all seems stunningly obvious, but it's been so obvious that nobody's actually addressed it and dealt with it. Um, and I love this one, embracing the digital chaos. That's the most fun. I've just come back from two weeks of reviewing proposals, project proposals in Brussels, and the stuff that people are doing with augmented reality and uh, personalized contact-based systems, which I have no idea what they mean, but they sound fantastic, and the demonstrations are really unbelievable. There is so much digital chaos going on, and bringing a little bit of order to that is one of the challenges that you have, and one of the challenges we have is helping you to do that, and it's just so much fun out there, there's so much going on. Um, investing in our people, we're going to be much more formal at the moment because we don't have any people. They belong to other universities, they belong to the funding council, they belong to third parties. It's been very difficult to get any kind of coherent approach to how the JISC staff are actually treated and addressed and supported. And we're going to spend a lot of time on that. Be warned, it's going to happen. And uh, lastly, committing to project management. Uh, unlike, unlike the past where Topsy just grew, we'll actually do things properly. And as a result, like Glasgow, we'll deliver a wonderful games by 2014. But in the meantime, things will keep powering ahead. Thank you very much. That, I think, is what's called a vague and generic talk, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions if there, in the unlikely event that there are any. Thank you so much. Any questions for Derek before we move on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. After the first slide, it's downhill all the way, wasn't it? <laughs> Uh, the, the, the change, the, what will be the biggest change for individual just customers? I think the biggest change is that we'll actually try and identify customers. 
Um, we have this kind of mantra in JISC at the moment that everybody uses some JISC services, but nobody uses all JISC services. So first of all, we'll try and get more penetration within the institutions that we already have relationships with to reach new people within those institutions. But if there's a single change, it's this one we're exploring of having a, a, a direct link between the institution, customer relation management, a direct link between the institution at a relatively senior level uh, and with named individuals within the JISC staff. We want to be both, we want to try and get into the equivalent of pro-vice chancellors and, and deputy college heads to listen to what they want and then to try and reassure them that we are delivering it with their staff, the ones that we deal with already. So I guess most of the people in this room I don't think will see a big change, but I think your institutions, I hope your institutions will feel that we're, we're much more proactively engaging with them. I said I was very comfortable with the lectern mics rather than being wired up. I should have changed my mind, shouldn't I? Yes. Any, uh, any more? Yes. It, it, it will sit within that third area of the, of the services. And yes, there is a very strong commitment to open research, open, open access, open, open everything. Um, I'm delighted. I'm a great fan of, of OA. And I think JISC was trying for a long time to be even-handed and work with the publishers and at the same time do the open stuff. I think they've much more firmly come down on one side now. And I know that uh, Martin Harrow, the new, the new head of JISC, is very committed to OA. Uh, so, no, it didn't appear on those slides because I now regard it as embedded rather than optional.